just want to clarify that um, because at the beginning it says name, uh, name submitted will remain on the current list for four weeks unless an extension has been prearranged. Here, here's, here's what we're saying is because there's a lot of prayer requests and this is probably a great time to kind of reset. Uh, there's a lot of prayer requests where someone would give a name and then there was nothing said about them again. And so we're always like in a quandary, you know, what about this person? And then Jennifer's, you know, constantly in a battle of trying to put more names on and not, not know about these other people. So that's why we put that on there. So we are going to hold to that. So if so, please, um, we're not trying to be mean about it. We're just trying to actually um, be cognizant of who, what's going on. And, and Terry's been doing a great job uh, with the prayer request part. And so we want to keep that up to date. And so if you have updates, please let us know. Um, uh, and if you want to keep them on, let us know as well. So anyway, just wanted to spell that out there. So anyway, any other questions about that? Okay. All right. Um, all right, we're back in Joe. <laughs> and uh, I really, I had to go back in my notes to figure out where in the world we left off. Um, but we, we, to the best of my knowledge, we, we left off here in Job 22. And, and this was basically, um, it's the third round of speeches with Job's friends. Um, I would say if you recall, but it's <laughs> kind of a game you probably not gonna recall. But the, the previous two where the friends interject various thoughts, various even accusations against Job, uh, Job comes back. Um, and and so here we have this third uh, basically round of speeches with the friends. Uh, just a couple of things here we put there in the objects in the study for this section. Um, by the way, we're not get going, don't get scared. We're not going through all of this tonight. Um, our, my hope is, is for each week to be able, if you kind of look at your outline there, um, the first part through, through A is where I kind of like to be able to get through tonight. Um, and then B will pick up next week. And then, etc. We can uh, take each section at a time. So that's where we're kind of shooting for. So, uh, so here are the objectives you have it there in your notes to examine the conclusion uh, of the quote-unquote great debate and the feeble efforts of Job's friends to convince him that he is deserving of his great suffering. So at this point, we have Job's friends thinking that Job had to have done something to cause all of this calamity that had come down upon him. Uh, so this, that's one part. So that's one objective, is to examine that conclusion of that. And then secondly, to observe how Job maintains his claim to innocence while staining his complaint that God is not hearing him. So let's, let me read that again so we can kind of get our minds around that. So the second part of the objective in this portion is to observe how Job maintains his claim to innocence. Now, let's, let's pause there and answer a question. Was he innocent in all this? Was Job innocent in everything going on up to this point? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Job hadn't done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all, he's in a quandary about the whole thing himself. So, so he had done nothing wrong. So he is innocent. But he's trying to basically uh, shore up to these friends the reality that he is innocent. So that's what the battle and the struggle is here. And so then while, that's the one part of that, then secondly is while stating his complaint to God that God is not hearing him. So he's still going through all of this. He's got the boils. That's where we left off. He's got the boils. Um, you know, he, he was basically in a state of just clamming up the last we spoke, uh, the last time we uh, met together, uh, talking about Job. He had basically clammed up. He wasn't really talking to anyone. 
Uh, and that was the point where the friends came, and they were basically in the time of mourning. Uh, then they go and have all their accusations, and then Job speaks. So that's where this all kind of boils down to. So here, uh, let's get into the text, and we will be in chapter 22 here, and beginning in verse 1. And, and notice it says, Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Can a man be profitable to God, though he who is wise may be profitable to himself? Is it any, is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? Or is it gain to him that you make your ways blameless? Is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you and enters into judgment with you? And notice, these are some very very pointed questions that he's asking here. Notice he begins and says, Can a man be profitable to God, though he who is wise may be profitable to himself? So was, was Job profitable in himself? He sure was. He was the greatest, the most, the richest person on known at that point in history, in that area, at least. That's what we know. From again, why? Because the Bible tells us that. So, and so the question is there in verse two: Is can a man be profitable to God, though he who is wise may be profitable to himself? And so, basically, he's proposing the question that. Basically, this is kind of a conundrum. And, and is, is it possible for somebody to be truly pleasing to God and then be also basically pleasing themselves? That's really what he's saying. Profitable to himself. Now, let me, let's ask a question here. Was, it, was Job sinning at all, from what we know from the Bible, in any of his, I guess you could say, profiteering? In all of, in any of his ways, the answer is no. Uh, I believe truly that God blessed him because of number one, because of his love for God. The Bible start, it starts off from verses one through four in chapter one, talking about his love for God, and then, and that's how it all started. So, in case there was any question, like we're running into now, basically. It puts it to rest right off the bat. Job loved God. So, did, and I truly believe it was God allowing him to profit uh, and to be the wealthiest person because of his love for God. Um, now, let's pause there, right? Does that mean that if we love God, we're always going to profit like Job? No. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, we can probably all say amen to that, right? Um, so it's not, no, that's not the case. But he chose Job to be able to have everything that he had. Why? Because he was glorifying God. Everything that we have, whether we're poor or rich, is all for one purpose, and that's to glorify God. Amen. Period. Amen. And so that's exactly where Job was before all this happened. It wasn't like he was in some great sin and then God just lowered the boom on him because of his sinfulness. He wasn't doing anything wrong. So we say all that to come back to these questions. Keep all that in mind. Here, and, and by the way, here's, here's, and I'm, I'm not trying to knock the friends, right? They're coming sight unseen. They're just seeing everything for what it is, looking all around. Everything's gone. The house has fallen. The children are dead. You see, he, they see Job's condition, what really could you come to a determination? And they are really trying, believe it or not, to be a help to Job because they think, wow, you have all this, you believe God gave you all this, and all of a sudden he took everything away except your wife? Then it's like something's not good, something's not right, and that's where we are. So, coming back here to verse 3, it says, is it any, is, and, and notice that, and this is a pointed question too, in verse 3, is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? 
So he asks the question, is there any pleasure to God actually that you're righteous? And he goes on and says, or is it a gain to him that you make your ways blameless? So he, they're basically asking the question, that you're righteous, that you're blameless, is that really any profit to God at all in the end? So let's ask the question here tonight. Our righteousness, our blamelessness, is that a profit to God? It's a not rhetorical. It is 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 that and that is that profitable to God? Our blamelessness tonight, each one of us, our righteousness that we have in Christ, is that um, is that profitable to Him? Yes. yes, it is. And why? Because exactly, it's all to God's glory. Why did He step out of heaven to come and to die on the cross for our sins? It wasn't just to redeem us so we would be able to, in, a, in essence, pat him on the back and thank you, God, for what you've done. It's so that we might glorify him in every aspect of our life. That's why he redeemed us. So, so what, what, so the questions again proposed, is, is it any pleasure, is there any pleasure there that God's taking in your righteousness towards him? Or the anniversary, or is it gain to him that you make your ways blameless? That in all of his ways, that's how, again, how Job started off. In all of his ways, that, that he detests sin is really in the essence what the original saying there. He hated sin, he detested sin. So then the questions raised here, you know, because you're doing all these things and you're blameless, is that really any profit to him? And I would say absolutely. Why? Because everything we're doing for God, to God or for God is for a reason. And it's for Him to receive all the honor and the glory and the praise. So everything that Job is doing in his glorifying God is was all for a reason. It wasn't for God. And so then we come, so that's but these are the questions that are being raised. And then we come to verse 4. Is it because of your... And notice this one. Is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you and enters into judgment with you? Now this is a good one, isn't it? Notice it says, is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you basically now? So, so again, it's building off the premise that these friends believe that Job is being corrected by God for some evil. And so that's where this verse comes in. Is it because of your fear? But then they bring up, you know, and, and notice in the beginning of Job, he feared God. It says that in the beginning of Job. He feared God and eschewed or resented or hated evil. That's what the Bible says. So we knew that he feared him. And if you recall... Sunday's message, it was basically on the wrath of God, right, that we talked about, or the fear of God. Is that a healthy thing? Absolutely. We can't just preach on his love all the time. We have to be able to talk about his wrath, his judgment, his fairness. And that's really what he's coming down to here. He says, is it because of your fear of him? And should we have a fear of God? Yes. It's not a fear that he's going to hit us over the head with a baseball bat if we do something wrong, but it's a godly fear that we understand who this God is. He's not the man upstairs. He's not this, you know, senile grandfatherly figure that we just come to like a genie in a bottle when we have a problem. He's God Almighty. He's the God that created this universe. And he created you and me. And so as we come to this verse again, it's because of your fear of him that he corrects you now. And then he goes on and enters into judgment with you. Basically, now he's pouring out his judgment on you. And, and because of his fear of him, this is why he's correcting you. 
But once again, that's, it, it, it's, a, it's a ludicrous question. And it really begs the question, does his friends fear God as they should? Because if we already know that Job was, his friends know he was fearing God. They spell it out even in this verse. So really the question really should be thrown on its head. Are they fearing God as they should? So a lot of the questions that they're proposing to Job, really it begs a bigger question of their own lives when you think about it. So anyway, moving along. Um, oh, let me, let me start off um, with your outline, with the um, two, the two uh, words that are missing there at the beginning. It's Eliphaz speaks and Job responds. Anyway, I want to get, didn't want to forget that. So there in point number one, Eliphaz speaks and Job responds. All right, so then coming on down uh, to verse five, it says, Is not your wickedness great and your iniquity without end? So, so then he's asking, he's taking this step further. Before he was talking about how profit, your profitability to God, your pleasure in God, does that really mean, you know, really any uh, amount of obedience to God? And it does. We've already talked about that. Verse 4, is your fear of him uh, that corrects you? Is it because of your fear of him that corrects you and enters into judgment with you? Is it because of your fear? Now he takes it even a step further and says, is not your wickedness great? Basically, isn't it truly a case where your sin is so great? And he goes on and says, and your iniquity or your sin without end. And he's asking the question, isn't this true? And is it true? No. <laughs> he hadn't done anything wrong. It wasn't because of his sin that God was judge, judging, it seems, Job. Was even God judging him? No, I don't believe he was at all. And, 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 and think about that, too, in our own lives. Let's step to just think of a second to talk about this. In our own lives, when, when God allows us to go through whatever it is in our life, whether it's health, whether it's um, needing a home, whatever the case may be, does it always mean that because we have some type of situation, in our life, does that mean that it's always because of sin? And the answer is no, it's not. Um, and there's, I think a lot of it is just because of the fall, if not probably 75, 80% of it is because of the fall, because of sin, because of the natural ramifications of sin in this world. You know, we were talking about Adam and Eve on Sunday. The other half of that, too, is, can you imagine not only, well, it's not, not only, that's the cherry on top, is the relationship they had with God. But can you imagine the utopia that Adam and Eve had? Everything they needed to eat, there was no sickness, there was no death. They had it made. You know, we talk about the American dream. That was the dream, right? I mean, they had everything, and they were walking with God, and there was no sin, there was none of that. So, just because you have uh, sickness now, or because you have, you know, whatever else is going on in each one's life, does that mean that there's sin there? No, I don't believe that at all. And Job is the reason. Uh, not the only reason, but it's a great reason, biblically, to be able to say that. And to be able to put a benchmark on that and say, hey, this is why. So, we come back to verse 5. Is, is not your wickedness great and your iniquity without end? No, that's not the case. Now, does that mean that Job is this spotless lamb that had never sinned? No. And the Bible never lets on that that was actually true. Uh, it doesn't say that he never sinned. He said he hated sin. And actually, as believers, even today, we should be able to say the same thing. And even at times when we do sin, that shouldn't be something for us to rejoice in. It should be something that we resent. And we're like, man, how in the world did I ever fall into that? And we climb out of that sin as fast as we can and get away from it. 
That should be our heart's attitude. And so here, once again, it, it, this is not the case. Verse 6, for you have taken pledges from your brother for no reason and stripped the naked of their clothing. He's basically saying, uh, and the brother there, it's not necessarily his own brother. He's just talking about mankind, your fellow man. He's saying that uh, you've taken pledges from your brother for no reason, stripped the naked of their clothing. Basically, they're now knocking how he got his wealth, how he, was, how he got everything that he had. They're saying that this is how you basically operated. And then he goes, they go on in verse 7, you have not given the weary water to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry, but the mighty man possessed the land, and the honorable man dwelt in it. So here, or in, in the, the question that came to my mind whenever I was reading through this and preparing this lesson was, how would they know? How would they know that he didn't give somebody something to drink? These people, I don't, I don't know if you somewhat even recall the math that we had passed out as far as the amount of, of uh, land span between where Job lived and these other men. I mean, it was, uh, you know, you're not talking about, you know, down to, it came to Walmart. Uh, you know, you're talking about hundreds of miles. And you know, on a donkey too, you know, it wasn't like you just, you know, zipped in on, you know, Amtrak. So it was, you, so how would they know? How, how would they really know how Job was operating? And Ian, can you imagine being Job through all this? You know, I'm not getting into it, trust me. Uh, but if you watch anything from last night, and that's all I'm going to say, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, and that's, this is probably how he felt. He's probably going to lash out at this point, right? And because and, all of it's false. Everything that this, that this friend is saying is false up to this point. And so then he comes into verse, again, to verse 7, and you've not given uh, the weary water to drink, you've withheld bread from the hungry. Who, who would do that? And why would God bless a person who says they love him if he was doing all these things? I truly don't believe he would. And then coming on down, uh, the uh, verse 8, that, but the mighty man possessed the land, and again, giving a euphemism for him, the, as the mighty man possessed the land, and the honorable man, basically the people who were genuinely righteous, the honorable man dwelt in it. So basically he's saying, you know, the mighty man has, you know, that's what we probably say about the government, right? Is, you know, the mighty have all, everything, and then here we are as the righteous people, we have nothing. And that's basically what the euphemism here is in this verse. So nothing's changed in all these years. Uh, coming back down to verse 9. You have sent widows away empty. Once again, how do we know that? And the strength of the fatherless was crushed. These are strong words, aren't they? I mean, you talk about, ooh, I mean, right to the heart. I mean, now you're not talking about even not giving people water or food. Now you're saying that you're sending widows away empty. And then he's making the claim that the strength of the fatherless was crushed the orphan. You know, I mean, come on. You know, really. And then he comes down into verse 10. Therefore, because of everything he just said, therefore snares are all around you, and sudden fear troubles you, or darkness so that you cannot see. And abundance of water covers you. So notice, now he's saying because of all these things that they purport, anyway, that this is the things that he's done. Because of all these things that you've done, terrible things, right? Maybe you've done them, it is terrible. But because of all that, now we see verse 10, it's obvious that therefore snares are all around you. And sudden fear troubles you and darkness so that you cannot see. An abundance of water covers you. So basically, short story, he's saying that because of all of the sins that you committed, now you're reaping what you sow. That's really what he's saying. And is that the case? Again, you have to flip all this on its head. Is that really the case? The answer is no. That's not why. So he goes on in verse 12, asks another uh, slew of questions. Is not God in the height of heaven? 
and see the highest stars, how lofty they are? And you say, what does God know? Can he judge me through the deep waters? Notice, now he's taking it to another level. Now he's saying, if, you know, and then this, and this friend's almost putting themselves on this ultra-spiritual level where he's now judging um, all, all of a sudden the spirituality of Job because he says it's not the, you know, isn't God basically see everything that's going on at the end of verse 12 and see the highest stars, how lofty they are? Basically, he sees everything. And then he goes into verse 13 where he says, And you say, what does God know? Can he judge me through the deep darkness? Basically saying, God doesn't see me. All these things that he's accused him of, he's basically saying that on the shell looks like he's righteous, but basically he's doing all these sins behind closed doors. And But what does God see? You know, God's not seeing all these things. And is that true? No, it's not true at all. And then he goes into verse 14. And he says, uh, thick clouds cover him uh, so that he cannot see. He walks above the circle of the heaven. Uh, will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod? Basically saying that, that uh, Job is heading down the wrong road and it's full of sin. And it's the old man. It's the old way. As he's just describing it here, which wicked men have trod, who were cut down before their time, whose foundations were swept away by a flood. And going back, talking about Noah right here at this point. And then it says, they said to God, depart from us. What can the Almighty do to them? And basically saying that these wicked men from old. Basically saying that this is the same things that Job is saying to God. And I would remind you too earlier on. I love the verse where it says, in all these things, everything that had happened to Job, it says, yet Job did not charge God foolishly or blame God foolishly. So he did not. And remember that. Through all of this, Job never blamed God foolishly. Like, like you remember as, as, as he mentioned to his wife, you know, you talk as one of the, the, the crazy people, if you recall that portion. He's saying, basically, he's questioning God, and very harshly maybe at times, but not foolishly, where he's basically saying he doesn't exist. You know, God's given up on him. Totally, he, he thinks at this point, and you can imagine, it does seem at least that way, right, to the human eye, that, you know, wow, something's not, not right. And even with Job, not just to his friends, but even with Job, Job's got to be questioning. Then he's got these friends in, in his ear, you know, you're a simple man, you're a simple man, you've done something wrong. I mean, can you imagine? Um, I don't think any of us could cope with that. Uh, and, and it, never mind what all he had just been through. So, he comes down to uh, verse 15. Will you keep the old way with the wicked men of Trod, uh, who were cut down before their time, whose foundations were swept away by the flood? They said to God, verse 17, depart from us. What can the Almighty do to them? Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from you. So he's basically saying here in that verse 18, yet he filled their houses with good things. Was Job's house full of good things? Sure. He was the wealthiest man. But notice what he says at the end. But the counsel of the wicked, uh, but the counsel of the wicked is far from him. So here, once again, he's, he's saying that because, because Job has all had, had all these things then basically God's taking all that away because of his sin. Then verse 19, the righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh at them. Surely our adversaries are cut down, and the fire consumes their own. And so why would we say that the righteous see it and are glad? Because 
I, I believe that the reasoning for that statement is, is that when we see God judge unrighteousness, is that a good thing? I would say yes, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we probably pause at that statement because why? Because we are the judge. We are the human race. We are the ones that were in rebellion. So we don't like to necessarily, yeah, I guess. But yes, as we talked about on Sunday, the wrath of God, he has to be just. He has to pour out judgment. Why? Because he is all justice. Mm -hmm. He is a righteous judge. So he has to. Um, but in this case, it's not that he's pouring out his indignation or his wrath on Job for some sin. It's because basically all of this, believe it or not, and it sounds crazy, it's for God's glory. That goes, that goes counter how we think, wouldn't it? Right. It's all for God's glory. Mm -hmm. So, why wouldn't we like that statement? Because we are the creation. Because if he can do it to Job, he can do that to me. Mm -hmm. Right? Wow. We don't like that. <laughs> We're like, ooh, no. Let's rethink that definition, right? But that's true. Everything that God does is, is to resound to his glory, period. So at times, even through loss, no matter what it is, it's all to resound to his glory. And, and, and anyway, we can all sit here and give illustration of that, right? Where God showed himself, even through a time of loss, just use that for instance, how that, how that at times, if we had given that over to the Lord, I don't understand your ways, but you're still in control. I still know that to be true. So with that said, does, that I still place my complete confidence and hope and trust in you and in you alone. And God bless. And I believe he always will in the end. Not how we think. But he'll get the glory, and he'll encourage our hearts through it. Coming on down. Um, he says in verse 18, Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is from me. The righteous seed are glad. Verse 20, Surely our adversaries are cut down. Verse 21, Now acquaint yourself with him, and be at peace. Isn't that a statement? Now acquaint yourself with him, like, like Job didn't know God. Right? And then he says, acquaint yourself with God. You now get to know him uh, and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Now, this is where we got to stop and put the brake on. He says, now acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. That's, that's a, you know, kind of a rub the wrong way anyway. But then notice the next statement. This is one we just want to talk about for a second. Thereby good will come to you. Why are these men, if they are, living their life for God? Faulty theology. Faulty at best. Notice what it says. He says there again, he says, thereby good will come to you. So, you get acquainted with God, and you get to know Him, and you start living for Him, then all this good will come to you. It, is that true? Not really. No, not really. Because here's the thing. We know the end of the story of Job, right? You kind of cheated looking in the back of the book. But here's the reality is this. What if, what if God had never given Job back anything? What if he hadn't restored him over and above what he ever had? Would he have still been just? Probably. Absolutely. And why? Because in the end, I love that portion of the end, we'll get there eventually, where Job says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. I truly believe that at the end of the day, 
if God had never given Job another thing, Job would have been perfectly satisfied. Why? Because he was once again totally satisfied in his God. And that's something that's a huge reality, isn't it? So we have to ask the question, how satisfied are we in our lives with God? Are we as satisfied where if, if, if God took everything away from us, everything, basically seemingly left us with nothing, but we can see him as he really is and realize that he still loves us and we still glorify him? That's an amazing place to be, isn't it? So, and then, and so that's where we're at. But that, so we have to pick that out, though, is where it says, uh, sure, uh, uh, but the, can't, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Verse 21, therefore good will come to you. That's not true. Verse 22, receive, receive, please, instruction from his mouth, to lay up his words in your heart. So now he's telling them how to get to know God. Uh, get instruction from his mouth and lay up your word, his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. Is that true? If we return to the Almighty, we'll be built up. That's true. If we, if, if we, if we genuinely are sinning and we return to God, He will build us back up again. That is true. But it doesn't apply here. <laughs> Why? Because Job hadn't sinned. It wasn't the case for Job. Then you will lay up. Then you will lay your gold in the dust, and the gold of Ophir uh, among the stones of the brooks. Yes, the Almighty will be your gold and your precious silver. Is that true? Yes. You know, and, and now he's he's acting like that. Job was living for God, um, doing everything he did uh, for God, but because of what he gave to him. So he's saying that he lived for God. Please God, but only because of what he gave to him in through this wording. And he's saying that then, when you truly get to know God, basically you're going to be able to throw your things in the stones of the brooks. Yes, the Almighty will be your gold and precious silver. Basically, these things that you had are going to be nothing, but he will be your gold and silver. And then he goes on and says in verse 26, For then you will have your delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. Was Job already doing that? Yes. He was already having a relationship with God. You will make your prayer to him. He will hear you. And you will pay your vows. You will also declare a thing. And it will be established for you. Is that always true? If I were to go and say, hey, um, I'm going to get a brand new car. Does that mean that God's going to just and here's a brand new car? No, not necessarily, right? Sometimes he does that. Not always. He's not holding, holding to that. So that, once again, faulty theology is why some of it's good, some of it's man. And verse 28, and you will, at verse 29, these last two verses for tonight, verse 29, when they cast you down and you say, exaltation will come, then he will say, the humble person. He will, and then notice verse 30, the last verse we'll look at tonight. He will even deliver one who is not innocent. Yes, he will be delivered by the purity of your hands. So, he's saying here at the end, he will even deliver one who is not innocent. And who is he referring to? Job, right? It's almost one of those little, you know, nudge, nudge, you know, that's you, Job. And so once again, we, we, we conclude this chapter here. And in, in the end, does any of it really hold any water at all? No. Why? Because Job was innocent. Mm -hmm. He hadn't sinned at all. And, and once again, some of these things that, once again, some of these things are just theologically so incorrect. But some of them could be true, right? If you knew that the person had actually sinned. But they're not taking, they're just, you know, taking it for face value that, wow, you know, you lost everything. Look at yourself. When you've got boils, everything else going on, I mean, what great sin have you done? 
you know? And then when he says he hadn't sinned, and it's like, oh, you know, now he, the, the wrath is coming, you know, because now you're basically just lying to us. Um, and that's basically where, we're, where we are at this point. So, once again, uh, probably not the greatest way to leave off tonight, um, but once again, I think it's a, it's a great reminder for us all that as the takeaway from it, I would say, is that is because God takes things away, don't ever fall either from other outside sources or maybe even internally that God has given up on us. Um, as his children, would he ever do that? No, no. Absolutely not. Um, he loves us. Mm -hmm. But he does correct us if we sin. Mm -hmm. But he loves us and he wants us to be able to please him and to worship him with every ounce of our being. Why? Because that's what he created us for. Right. So once again, you know, here, my heart goes out to Job at this point. You know, you just want to, it's like one of those where you want to just kind of shoo away his friends mm -hmm. and say, you know, discredit all that they just said. It's not true, right? But that's only because we've seen the end of the world. But anyway, we'll leave off there tonight. And I trust that, and that was my initial goal with Job, is that it would be a blessing to our hearts. And, and I believe it will be because every one of us can attribute our lives to Job in some regard. We might not be going to, and what, what, we've never gone through what Job has ever gone through, but snippets of it, we have. We've all gone through health situations. We've all gone through loss of maybe a loved one, maybe possessions, maybe whatever the case may be. We can all identify with him. I think that's the beauty of Job. Um, and, and, and then at the very end of it, be able to still glorify God with our lives. And that's what God wants. So let's close the word of prayer tonight as we end. And Father, we thank you so much, your God, for your word. Thank you, Lord, Father, for the opportunity to be able to, to sit here tonight and be able to go through your word and to dissect your word and to be able to, uh, to, be able to share your word, your Father, and and to be able to build us up into the same reality that you wanted even from this story. I mean, the story is not just a neat story of how that you redeemed a man and lost everything. It's to be able to get everyone in the story's attention back on you. And even though Satan would try to destroy our lives, even though Satan will come and try to upend our lives, even, even to death, we know that we can trust you in all things. We know that whatever you allow into our lives, it's there for a reason. It may not always be because of sin, but it's there for a reason. I pray, dear Father, that you'd help each one of us to be able to learn to glorify you in every aspect of the life we're, we're, we're going through, even presently. And we're thankful for it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We got to watch our friends too, Justin. That's right. It says a lot about our friends too, right? Yeah, sometimes. Uh, be true. careful who you're chumming around with. Yeah, that's true. Sometimes it's like a reason. All right. All right. I'm going to take it. Let's take it.